Today we are discussing Fiserv, ticker F-I-S-V. Over the next few minutes, I'll discuss my thoughts on both the valuation of this company and its business quality. First up, we have a market cap of $74 billion, enterprise value of $94 billion, so you see about $20 billion in net debt on this business. They are operating in the IT services industry. So not a bad amount of debt on the business seems probably going to be reasonable although i do wonder why you have so much debt on a services business we'll have to dive a little bit into that um as well so they provide payment and financial services technology worldwide seems like a good area to operate they have acceptance fintech and payment segments um, point of sale merchant and requiring digital commerce solutions they have a cloud-based point of sale uh, management system connect independent software vendor system fintech offers c customer deposit loan accounts Payments offers credit card transactions, um, security fraud products. Overall, sounds like a very good industry to operate in. Serves business, banks, credit unions, and other financial institutions. So, sounds like a really interesting industry where you could have some nice margins. We'll see if that plays out. Beta of 0.864 is a good sign. That's lower than one, which would be the S&P 500 average. And so, the lower your beta is, the more of a possible indicator that this might be a high quality business. Now, let's work on to our return on invested capital chart. Now, we do look like we have a little bit of cyclicality here, but it doesn't look like it goes with the business cycle. You can see that although they serve banks, credit unions, and financial institutions, they sailed straight through the financial crisis without any problems. 2007, they had 7%, 7%, 7%, 7%, 7% return on invested capital all the way from 2007 to 2011. And then they continued to improve their returns up until they hit about 16% in 2017. Now, it does look like in 2019, they dropped down to 2 percent here now my guess is the big drop here from 2018 to 2019 is really probably driven by some sort of acquisition you can see the massive jump in revenue from 2018 to 2019 of 5.8 billion dollars 10.1 billion dollars in 2019 that to me is saying that in this time frame you had a massive acquisition that probably increased your asset base significantly although if i had to guess it's probably a significant increase in your goodwill and intangible assets and not actually your baseline assets we're going to have to dive into that but again you see this massive growth in assets over the last 10 years 25 percent it's out of line with your 15 percent revenue growth 13 percent eps growth and again i think probably part of that is overpaying or paying up for very good it services assets and that's probably playing a big part in what we're reporting as a return on invested capital but when you look on a 10-year basis which is averaging in these last four years you have actually really good returns 10 percent return on invested capital 20 percent return on equity these sorts of numbers are exactly what i'm looking for in a high quality business they are telling me that I can achieve my target returns as a shareholder. If I want 10%, 12%, 15%, or even 20% returns, then having a return on equity of 20% is a way to achieve that. You're using debt intelligently here because you've turned a 10% return on invested capital into a 20% return on equity. And once you hit that 20% mark on your return on equity, you're in very good levels. Not to mention, one of the things that trips up a lot of the companies to not being able to make it on my watch list is that their return on equity is lower than their 10 year CAGR of growth. But that's not true here. We're growing revenue at 15%, free cash flow at 17%, EPS at 13%. All of that can be funded by my return on internally generated return on equity. So that's a very good sign that I'm not going to need to dilute myself over time because I can fund my growth internally. So the the other sign here of a high quality business is when you look at these 10 year median margins. Now gross profit of 47% doesn't sound amazing, but the key here is look at how high your free cash flow and your EBIT margins are compared to gross profit margins. A lot of times when you have gross profit of 47%, you might have free cash flow and EBIT margins of 5%, 7%, 10%, but you're all the way up at 20%, which tends to be the world class type range and you're not needing 60, 80% gross profit margins in order to achieve that. that means the business is being managed very tightly. I like that sign and how that business is being managed. So all indicators are that this is a high quality business. Again, we're going to have to do a little bit of a deeper dive once we reach the balance sheet to understand what happened here. But again, I'm pretty sure this is probably acquisition based based upon just a few 
interesting numbers off the front. Now, when we get into valuation, we can immediately see that the market agrees with my assessment that this is a high quality business because it is trading at a PE of 30. A PE of 30 is certainly a high valuation ratio and it's about twice as high as what I like to pay for business. I like to buy stocks at a PE of 15 or less. This is trading at 30. Now, what could justify a PE of 30? High quality business, high growth, high return on invested capital. Do we have that? Check, check, check. We have all three. You have your high quality business, you have your high returns on capital, and you have your high growth. 15% growth rates is definitely in the range of what I would consider high growth, and it's probably in the range of sustainable growth when you're comparing it, of course, to return on equity. So this makes sense you would trade at a high valuation. It's hard to argue it's overvalued, but it's certainly not undervalued at a PE of 30. Um, it's just understandably trading at a high price. This is the type of thing that would you know, indicate that, okay, it might not be an immediate buy. Maybe it goes on the watch list. We wait towards a good opportunity to buy. But again, we're not there yet. We need to get into some more numbers first. So you can see pretty strong steady growth here from 2013 to 2018 in your revenue line. But, you know, you're talking single digits. And then you have a massive growth for two years in 2019, 2020. But again, I think there were acquisitions playing involved here. Um, what's interesting as well, though, your gross margin actually improved over the course of a decade. You really like to see this, that those acquisitions helped, you know, steadily improve, but they were improving before then as well. Anytime you can grow that gross margin and it could potentially the operating margin, you start to talk about operating leverage. Operating leverage is a really key word I like to see in my investing process because it really drives outstanding returns. I mean, look at the operating profit going from a billion dollars, $3.6 billion in a decade, more than tripling, almost 4x. Those sorts of returns get very, very interesting to you as a shareholder. Now, we don't see a lot of that operating leverage yet on the bottom line basis. You actually saw it drop in 2019 with the acquisition. So maybe their acquisition you know, has a maybe lower operating margin. Complicates the numbers a little bit, but that's not as important as just kind of understanding how the underlying business goes. And when we look at before the acquisition numbers, 2013 to 2018, five-year period, you doubled or more than doubled your EPS in that five-year period. Very, very, very attractive. So if you do that over another five years, then you have another doubling. You can 4X in a decade. Very good numbers. Now, it did drop. So I'm wondering if perhaps there was a dilution event in this acquisition in addition to taking on debt. And you can see they continued growing again. And they're back up to $3.94 per share. So they actually ended up with a very good result still across the decade, even though they had a big dilution event is what I'm going to guess. If you're enjoying this video, if you're learning something, please hit that like button. I'm going to continue to add value as we go through the income statement, balance sheet, cash flow statement, hoping to convince you that I'm worthy of a subscription by the end of this video. So let's go to the income statement next. Now, Again, we already said our cost of goods sold, your gross margin's getting better and better, and it's leading to something really cool. You have a gross profit more than 4X, almost 5X over the course of a decade, very good numbers. Now, it hasn't, as I said, translated into a 4 or 5X in the operating profit line, and that's because their SG&A grew quite significantly as well. But you see these two jump rates again in 2018, 2019, jumping up to 2020. Again, I'm assuming acquisition-based here. Um, it does mean to me that maybe they need to trim some of their SGNA based upon the new acquisitions. They might be a little bit bloated from those acquisitions and haven't done enough to trim at this time. Now, it gets really interesting when we look at shares outstanding, though, because what I see here happening is we have a, a story of a few periods they were steadily buying back shares from 2013 to 2018. This was boosting EPS growth. It looks really, really interesting because what they did was they doubled their net income over that period, but they more than doubled their EPS because they retired over 20% of their shares outstanding in a five-year period. That's very attractive. You're talking about buying back anywhere from three, four, or 5% of your shares per year in order to maybe three to 4% of your shares per year in order to achieve that sort of share retirement really attractive how those numbers work out. Now, they quickly increased their shares outstanding 2019 and 2020. Again, I believe these are acquisitions based, but then the important thing is they've started buying back shares again, and you can already see them dropping another five to 8% over the next two years once they completed those acquisitions. So it tells us a good sign that we should see continued improvement in the future. Very good numbers here, continue to be very interested in this business. Now, 
balance sheet, the important thing to understand and, and how we identify, of course, these acquisitions is going to be some of the numbers changing here. And goodwill is our big sign. Goodwill is the amount of money that you overpaid over the tangible book value when you made an acquisition. It's not a bad thing. doesn't mean you paid too much. It just means this is how the accounting works. You can see a gap here of $31 billion. You can see a gap here of $15 billion. So they paid $45 billion over the tangible assets when they made this acquisition. And that's a huge change in your asset base. You went from $11 billion to $77 billion in a single year. And that is what happened here, just like I thought. So you collapsed your return on invested capital from 15% down to 2%. The important thing is this does not matter. This is an accounting gimmick. Let's go back here. I don't care about total assets as a shareholder. I care about your tangible assets of this business. And what we have here is pp e of $2 billion. There's no inventory in this business, but pp e of $2 billion is turning into over $2 billion in net income. Very impressive. You're seeing over 100% return on tangible capital. And that is one of the key signs that this is an incredible business that you'd wanna own. Now, of course, Goodwill is there. It's never going to be removed. It does mean their accounting numbers are going to be relatively lower than they otherwise would be for the duration of the business. Not a problem. I don't have any issues with that. But again, very strong underlying business model here. Very attractive. You have to ignore numbers like this. And it makes perfect sense when you can finally see the balance sheet. Now, the other thing that happened, of course, is they increased their debt. They made this acquisition. They added $16 billion in debt. And it's why you have something like this where you've seven extra long-term debt over the course of a decade. I don't like that number because you're growing your debt faster than your earnings. You're growing your debt faster than your revenue. But I have a feeling that this is like a one-time event. You're not necessarily going to repeat this. I don't. There's no clear trend that they're all always adding debt. So I don't have any major concerns. There's no clear trend that they're having to dump a bunch of capital in the PP and E, no concerns there. But the balance sheet tells us the story of what happened here. You can see the steadily growing retained earnings. That's always a good sign that you can see as well. Now let's go to the cash flow statement. Here you're gonna see a big issuance of debt, of course, in this 2019 year, that's your acquisition. You can see a big cash expenditure, that's your acquisition, of course, debt acquisition number, they're matching out. So you basically, it looks like you had $15 billion in cash, plus you issued a bunch of shares. That's how you made our acquisition. Now, they do have pretty steady stock-based compensation. One of my concerns here is that you had this acquisition, you increased your employees, and now you have a big SG&A, or you have a big stock-based compensation. It, was, it used to be much smaller. Now it's basically tripled to 4X in size. I would have some concern that the current stock-based compensation is a little higher than I would like. Now, you're still buying back shares every year. And it looks like they don't pay dividends. They're just doing buybacks. And I love that capital allocation. I love owning companies that put all of their free cash flow into buybacks. It's a great setup for a good performance as a shareholder. Um, it means that you're going to be constantly destroying the share count. And if you own a high quality business, you always want to own more of a high quality business if you can get a good enough price. So when management does this with their cash, I'm very impressed with it. I like how that is set up for you as a shareholder. I'm totally fine with them not paying dividends. The only thing is, is I, you know, I kind of wish that this stock based compensation was a little lower. I kind of wish that the SGNA was being managed a little bit tighter so you could start to see some of that operating leverage, but it could be a, something that they, you know, introduce in the future or it just takes time to understand how the business works. They've only made this acquisition a couple of years ago. Could play out either way. Overall, Fiserv looks very, very interesting. Is going to be an immediate add to my watch list. Let's summarize some quick things here. High quality business. Return on invested capital is of course already incorporating goodwill and intangibles before the acquisition. And what we can clearly see when we look at these numbers is at least for the past decade, but certainly in the last few years, they're earning over a 100% return on your tan net tangible assets, which is very, very attractive. So I like those numbers. I like the setup that I have here. Very strong, high quality business. The fluctuations you see here are not due to cyclicality in the overall market, but really really due to underlying changes in the accounting, and that's totally normal, totally okay. You can see those very good returns of turning a 47% gross profit margin into a 20% return on your free cash flow margins. Very strong indicator of good quality business. Your return on equity exceeds your growth rate, which means you're able to internally generate your cash flows and your growth. You're able to return cash to shareholders without diluting them. You're able to return cash without having to constantly raise new debt. All very good signs. 
Fiserv is an amazing business from what I'm seeing here. The only question for me is current valuation. Paying a PE of 30 is probably something I'm not willing to do. So I would like to wait for a cheaper price. And if I can get the stock at a cheaper price, it starts to look very attractive to me. And so that is exactly why it is going on my watch list. If you learned something, if you want to see more videos like this, hit that like button. That lets YouTube know you're enjoying my content. And don't forget to subscribe. I'm working through every company in the S&P 500 and I am finding all of the best ones through this process. And I already have a list of my favorite 40 in this watch list playlist up above. I hope you'll check out that playlist. I think you could learn a lot from it. And those are my favorite companies that like Fiserv met all of the criteria to get included. If you'd like to learn how to study these companies yourself with this sort of software, it is quickfs.net that I am using. The affiliate link for me is in the show notes below. The first link in the description, quickfs.net. Thank you for listening. And until next time, stop paying fees and start building wealth.